I tell you one thing, there is never a dull moment, amen, in God's house. And, um, you know, you can show up thinking that things will go a certain way, but then God shows up. He has his way, amen? Um, I hope that today that the word that was uh, impressed on my heart will be a blessing to all of us, including myself. And it has been something that I've been pondering about for a while now. And how many of you today um, likes to watch those DIY channels? I do. You know, um, those, uh, I, know I know Tim does, because he fixes his own, uh, his own basement, right? <laughs> Did you see the Facebook uh, pictures? Uh, a few months back, there was a huge channel around his house, you know, so he watches DIY. Um, you know, the one thing that is... Uh, consistent with that show is that, um, you know, us guys, you know, our wives have this uh, idea, oh, my kitchen is old, I need a new one. And then we're like, oh, I can do it. And before you know it, uh, the walls are torn apart, electrical outlets are hanging all over the place, and then Rob has jobs to do. <laughs> but um, the thing is that, you know, we're always into the idea of, oh, well, we can do this, you know. We can do this. And uh, many times, you know, the show, eventually the professionals come in, take, takes over, and before you know it, there's a, you know, a magazine-worthy um, kitchen or whatever there. Um, you know, it's, the thing is that it's always the same, you know. We, why is that that we, we, we try to do stuff, and then, you know, halfway through, we have no clue what's going on, we're in the middle of a huge problem, and the one thing that is missing there is that when we, when we started, <clears throat> can somebody give me some water please? When we started, um, we had no plan of what was to be achieved. I think, I think as human beings, we have this huge ego, you know, and it is fueled by this gigantic, ginormous, uh, inferiority complex that we don't need to ask for help from anybody, that we got this. You know, that connection between, you know, our brain and our mind is somehow disconnected. And we feel that, you know what, I can do this. And it's always the same. It's always the same. It never ends up right. It always ends up where... You know, we're, we're in need of help eventually after spending so much time, so much effort, so much energy trying to fix something. And I watch those shows and I feel guilty because, you know what, I'm just like that. You know, I went to, um, uh, when we first moved to Canada and I learned about buying a bookcase in a box. Okay, I'll buy a bookcase in a box and I'll fix it up. So we moved to, to our apartment, and I, we wanted a TV stand. So we went to Walmart. We got a nice, cheap thin one in the box there. Got home and um, started fixing it. There was instructions there, if you're sure, yes, but you know, I wasn't even thinking about that. I got it together. I got it together, right? And there were four sections, four, four walls, right? And then both sides had doors, and you had two shelves in there. My shelves never worked. Because I didn't put the, the things in the right place. And so I had to put all the items all the way in, or else the shelf will just tumble over. Because it didn't fit right. Wife never knew about that because I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Until today. So I, I, <laughs> I'm guilty of that stuff, you know. And, you know, the biggest nightmare I go to, we go to Ikea, and you see all the husbands do this... Is she going to buy one of those fancy kitchen? Am I going to be able to fix it? You know? And, oh, no, I can do it. I can do it. Don't worry. You buy it. I can do it. You know? And then you go home, and then your, your entire living room is just bits of pieces all over the place. And guess what? The instruction manual that has pictures is probably hidden under one of the side panels. And so you're fixing, fixing, fixing. A jigsaw puzzle now is on the way. And then when you're done, it's against the wall, and then there are a few pieces still on the floor. And the question is, is this, is IKEA in the, in the business of making profit? I don't think they'll put extra parts in the box because each part costs money, right? 
So why would we have extra pieces? You know, and there we have the wives, honey, are you reading instructions? And he's like, I don't really need to, or do I have to read it? You know, but it's, it's a familiar story. You know, it's, it's universal. Nobody in this room here can say I'm not in that category because I'm in it, and so are you. All right? Now, um, we often, you know, try to overcomplicate things. We always feel that we don't really need help, you know. Um, we don't really need a set of instructions to tell us what to do, right? It's, it's a simple truth that we're all victims of, you know. We try to avoid, you know, the experts, they, they, they spend time creating all these manuals, all these lists of things to do, because they know that there is... This is the only way that it can be done properly. And we always try to avoid these. Always try to avoid these. Right? Sometimes it looks as if, are those people who made those things, are they, are they right or are we? Right? Sometimes it looks as if we are right and they are wrong. Right? But today I want to I focus on on the same thing, the same simple truth. And hopefully, at the end of it, I can paint a picture of um, what this really means. Now, I said all of that, but why? You know, God has given us uh, an instruction manual, right? God has given us his word. And I'm going to give you a couple of facts in a short bit. And, um, you know, we'll see exactly where this is going, right? Information is important, but sometimes we don't really put the effort to try to understand what it means. And sometimes we're in the fix, and now we really have to go to the instruction manual, and here's where we make the biggest mistake. What we do is that we'll just kind of, you know, just kind of skim through to see exactly what we need, and we just learn just enough to get this stuff to work. But we never really truly understand the full potential of what that thing can do for you or all the benefits it has. What we have eventually gotten from our browse through is enough to get by. And what happens is that we end up having a lot of cool stuff, but we never really are able to utilize the full potentials of what these things can do for you or how simple it can make life. We all have fancy phones and whatever and, and all these things, and we just know how to put it on and make calls. Right, Lily? Oh, man, I'm in trouble today. <laughs> or, you know, you go to the store. I used to work at um, Canadian Tire on the parts desk, right? And Canadian Tire is notorious for uh, hiring um, school kids for a job, and it's okay, right? And so these guys are there, after a few months, they're hearing things here and there from the experts, and you go to buy something, and they will take you down the royal road, and they'll make you believe stuff that is not even real. And it sounds so nice that the person, and I'm standing there, and I'm looking, in, and the person leaves the, the parts desk believing every single thing that they were told. That's called secondhand information, right? Now, who is at fault there? Would you blame that young guy, or would you blame the person who believes secondhand information, right? And, you know, it's a vicious world we live in, and this is how it is, you know. Most of the time, we try to, we are almost not left with a choice but to take secondhand information. And sometimes what we get is not the real truth, right? We don't get that. Now, do you know that this is a, uh, I took this off of, uh, of, of the internet. Um, in the U.S. alone, every day, not every year or every week, every day, over 150,000 Bibles are either sold or given. Every day. And one person claimed that if you were to start reading the Bible this very moment, then 
70 hours afterwards, you're done. You know? But the sad part of the whole thing is that in as much as the Bible is distributed so much, and we know so much about it, it is the least read book. Some houses have a Bible on every room, on every floor, and from every different, you know, um, commentary that you would have with them also. But it's never read. God's instruction manual for life is called the Bible. This book which has lasted through many centuries, which has been translated in so many different languages, is recognized by those who don't even believe God as one of the greatest pieces of literary script. It's a unique book. It is praised by almost everyone. But there is just one thing, one problem. It is unknown. It is not understood. And it is not used for its intended purpose. Intended purpose, when you, whichever job you're in, Whatever, whatever you do, there is always something that defines what you have to do. And that, those steps or lists or whatever are contained in the book. As Christians, as Christians, the Bible is our instruction manual. And I'm not going to ask the question today and ask people to raise their hands to say, well, is the Bible your instruction manual? No, I'm not going to do that because even I also fall victim to that. All right? But the thing is, I want us to look at a few scriptures today and just try to see if we can rediscover what the Bible really means. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 1. And I'm reading this here from the message version. And there's a website called BibleGateway.com. James... Um, Introduce me to this here. Very wonderful website. You can go on that website and you can read the same verse in different translations. And it just opens your understanding so much more about what it really means. So I'll read here from the message. The word was first. The word present to God. God present to the word. The word was God. In readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness, and the darkness couldn't put it out. Verse 6 to 8, there was a man, his name John, sent by God to point out the way of the life light. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way of the light. Now, if you do not know the Bible, you do not know about this. If you do not read the Bible, you will never discover that God, the Word was God. You will never discover that John, what John wrote here to say that he was there to show the way of the light. I want to tell you a story. Back in the days when Morse code was first um, developed, they were looking, there was an, an ad in a newspaper for a Morse code operator to work in the secret service. And so lots of young men, bright young men, they went uh, for this interview. And so they showed up, and they were in this waiting area. And then after a while, this one, when they walked into that room, it was buzzing. People were all over the place. And the Morse code was sticking in the air. They, they kept hearing the beep, 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 whatever. Right? And um, they sat there. And then after a few minutes, this one young man, he just walked in. 
He came into the room where all the persons that were there for the interview were sitting down, and he headed towards the door. Now, just like you and I, we're like, well, who is he? Why is he, you know, being so rude? We're all here, and he's walking towards the door. He went to the door. No one opened the door. He opened the door, went in, and they were all furious, like, what? Of course, they probably used some language I can't use today, right? But they were... So after about five minutes, the manager came out and he said, I thank you all for coming, but the post has been filled. So one smart Alec, like, but sir, um, neither of us um, went in for the interview. How can the post be filled? Well, the manager said, there is a Morse code repeating in the building all the time, even now. That says, if you can read this code, then walk through the door and the job is yours. If you can read this code, walk through the door, the job is yours. My sermon is done. <laughs> I saw a, a, a Gillette commercial the other day. Guy came in. There were six guys sitting on this bench here. And this one guy came in, sat on the other bench. He looked on the wall, and he saw the owner, his head was completely shaven. So what he did, he went, got his Gillette shaver, shaved his head bone dry, came back here and, and sat down. The owner opened the door, looked across, looked over to the guy with the bald head, and guess what? You got a job, right? <laughs> but the thing is that the Morse code, he knew the Morse code, right? He, he walked in there. He didn't hear the ticking of Morse code. He understood what the Morse code was saying. Do we understand what the Morse code is saying today? Do we? Right? And at my workplace, we have some manuals that we swear by, you know, and we make sure that we have to stick with the numbers in there or else the part comes back to us rejected. Right? The Bible is God's instruction to us. And it was the word that was given to us by God, inspired by men, for us to read and for us to develop a personal, close relationship with him. And the Bible is there so that all can read it and all can discover this closeness that can be created. Nothing is developed or, or, or strengthened by not doing anything. You have to put something into it. Amen? And uh, I came across this, this phrase... A long time ago it says ignorance doesn't mean that we are not smart it actually means that we are too lazy to not want to be ignorant you know in my home country the word ignorant is used when you are when parents or somebody is being very mean to their kid and said you ignorant little Right? But to be ignorant is to lack knowledge of whatever you are ignorant of, right? But if we are, if we can be wise enough to try to discover what is it I'm not seeing, then we are not any more ignorant, right? We become aware of what we're missing. When I was in trade school, first week, one, one job we had to work on was to make a square hole into a part, half inch square hole. And so the second years, this is a, a trend that has been happening for years. And we knew that there were pranks coming up and no one took the time to go and figure out what it means. And of course, we were sent to the tool room to borrow a square drill to drill a square hole. And guess what? Many of us did it. Don't ask me if I did it. 
I can't lie on the pulpit here, okay? <laughs> but the thing is that because we're not aware of, of information, we, we don't know what to do, right? I want to bring it to another scripture. Luke chapter 11, verse 9 to 13. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which your father, which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit, sorry, let me get this here. Uh, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There again, I'm saying, if we don't know what's in the Bible, we will never discover what this here says to us. If you don't know, if you need something, you ask. The manual for God's spoken word, the Bible, God in all his wisdom reminds us in his word of his promise. I guess it makes sense to say that you never judge a book by its cover. You know, never judge a book by its cover. And as food does good to our body, so does the word of God to our spirit. And if we interpret what uh, the word of God says here in Luke 11 verses 9 to 13, as food is good to our physical body, so is the word to our spirit. So what is this word here ministering to? The body or the spirit? I say the spirit. And if we ask of God, then I believe that we will receive what is spiritually beneficial to us. Meaning that God will bless you as His will. Doesn't mean you can pray for a car and it will show up. Have you ever heard of the mole hill and the mountaintop comparison? It's a universal phrase that is used worldwide to, to describe different things. Simply put, what this really means is that what you put in is what you will get out. Let's do some physics one-on-one -on -one here today. If I were to tie a string on the ceiling here and have a 10-pound steel ball hanging from it, and I were to pull this ball as far to one side, and I were to release this ball without any force or any additional push to it, this ball will swing to the other side it will not exceed the height at which it was initially released from. And on return, it will never go past the point at which it was released. So if you stand here and the 10-pound ball is coming towards you and you didn't push it, you release it, it will never touch you. You know, in, in high school, we had a, a plate there and a little pendulum to do that experiment, right? On Facebook, there's a professor that stands against the wall and the ball is coming to his face. And I saw the, the, the video and I remember my high school days, you know. But the, the simple thing is this here. You didn't do anything. So it doesn't do anything else. It just takes the energy that it has there, go this way and come back. But if you were to just give it a push, what will happen? It will swing past the point. It will come back, and if the wall is still there, it will break through the wall. Same thing goes for, for life. If you don't put anything into it, what you have is a little molehill there. But if you really, if you do your part, then there is a result at the end. 
Having the Bible doesn't necessarily mean that you know what's in it. Having a new Bible that has never been opened doesn't necessarily mean that you know what's in there. Not spending time reading the Word of God doesn't expose you to the blessings, expose you to the instructions, expose you to things that you can do to avoid situations. See, as you walk with God, and, you know, when Adam, when, when Adam and Eve lived in the garden, I guess they're the only people who had a chance to have a midday stroll with God, right? You know? What do we have today? For When you say, we're going to walk with God, it's, that's, that's the instruction, right? How do you do that? How do you do that? How will you do that? The only way you can, the, there's only one way. The only way you can do that is by getting to know God so you can walk with Him. Can you imagine walking with somebody for a mile, not knowing the person and talking nothing at all? It's like two persons having their own stroll side by side. There is no interaction, there is no connection, no communication. A person goes his way, you go your way walking the same path, and at the end of it, nothing happens. But it, if I start to walk with Rob, for example, and we start to talk about stuff, he gets to know me, I get to know him, at the end of that walk, guess what? We are a little bit closer than we were when we started. So, if you are to walk with God, it means that you have to do something. You have to read God's word. You have to try to know who God is. And I'm pretty sure the more and more we do that, what happens? We get to know Him more. We get to realize that there are gifts there. There are blessings there. We get to realize that His grace is sufficient. And guess what? You get this opportunity that God knows you by name. And if God knows you by name, so too is, uh, does the accuser. You know who he is. And if the accuser knows that God knows you by name, guess what? He will think twice about trying to interfere with someone who God knows personally. See, God knows us, right? But do we know God? So we can communicate. That's the point I'm getting at here, really. You know? So, the only way this can happen is if we were to dig into the Word, have Bible study, and have your own time. I want to go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse uh, 34. And again, I'm reading the message version here. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't give up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the times come or time comes. Here again, if you didn't read the word of God, you will never discover this promise. In order for me to give my entire attention to what God is doing, I will have to be fully aware that He is starting something or He has already started doing something in my life. I have to be aware of that. And that is the effort part. That's the... That's the Pushing the ball part there. You know, it's like reading a good novel. I know I don't read anymore, but back in the days, if you were reading a novel and it gets to a part where the story takes a different plot, what do you want to do? You want to keep on reading, right? 
You, you want to get to the point where you, you discover what happens. Right? Because it's very intriguing, you know, like, hey, well, what's going to happen? Did you ever try to find, or are, did we ever try at some point to let that same intrigue, interest, resonate in our heart? Well, hey, let's, let, let's keep going, you know? Sometimes it's like, well, okay, this, you know, I like the idea of to read the Bible in a year. But the one part I don't like about it is that sometimes in our busy day, oh, I've got to read these few verses. And I'll try to squeeze that in fast. You know, yesterday I gave my son to write um, the ABCs five times. First one was nice and good. Second was almost there. And then as he got to the third and fourth, it was like, you know, cockroach jumping on ink and sometimes that's the kind of effort we, we, we put into getting to know God or looking into the instruction manual for life it's the same like having, it, having the instruction manual stuck under one of the pieces of the Ikea cabinet as we study the Bible or the manual more of God is revealed to us. Our faith to believe in, in Him becomes more alive. You know, faith, it has to be constantly fed. Or else that strength, that, that belief will soon decrease and decrease because there is nothing that fuels it. As we read the Word of God more, there is a closer connection. And what happens, you know, I'm a science kind of person, you know. Um, they say that the Earth's surfaces are shifting plates. And mountains are created when plates are shifted together to collide. And then they do this. And then you have a mountain experience. What happens is that the more you try to discover who God is and, uh, and how much God is to you, you start to, to shift from this little molehill into building this mountaintop experience, you know. We don't have any more pride about our little hill, but we can now give thanks to God for moving us. You should know that once you get into the Word of God, you start to read it. He is your greatest advocate. You have a real connection with God. Well, why do we have to read the Bible? You know, why do we have to spend so much time getting to know who God is? Or to let this instruction manual become a part of our lives? The thing is that it is not if difficult situations will, you know, like jump up in your life. But when, they, when it will happen. It's a matter of when, not if. You know, difficult situations will happen. If I were to take Mike, for example, who knows to fix his car, and another person who is jumping the car, turn the key kind of person, driving along the way, and a clunking sound comes up somehow. There's going to be two different ways of how we, uh, that these persons are going to react. Mike, for example, will know, well, listen, man, I, I don't have to stop in the middle of the road here. I can just drive home slowly and get this fixed. God knows how the other person will, will react. 
God knows. Right? In life, when these little things happen, what do we panic? Do we operate like the turn the key kind of person and just go into a fit and just don't know what to do? Or do we do like Mike? Mike knows what to do because he has already some ideas because he was reading something. See, once you have a close relationship with God, what you have is the one thing that is absent if you don't have that relationship. God hears your prayer. God hears your prayer. He hears your prayers regardless. Right? But once you are close to God, you get, to, you get that. Sometimes when we have difficult situations, you know, I have nothing against, you know, intercession. It's a lifeline for the church, you know. We have to pray for each other. That's a given. But if I'm praying for you, but you don't pray for yourself, uh, what's going to happen there? Right? And a person just cannot start praying to God and believe in God if there is no substance to the prayer. And the substance to the prayer comes from knowing who God is. And to know who God is, you have to know His Word. Amen? Or else the prayer is in vain. It is in vain. In Acts 19, Paul was in Ephesus and he found some disciples there. And he asked them, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they said, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. We have not as much heard. See, if you don't, if you don't know, try to know who God is, then you are missing out. All they remember or all they probably read about was the baptism, John's baptism. If you read Acts 19, you'll get the full story. All they knew of was John's baptism. And they did not go further to, to learn more about what's next. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know who he was. In John chapter 10, verse 9 to 10, it says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Our emotions are affected by the written and spoken words daily. People talk to us. We get offended. Uh, we read things. It affects our emotions. The Bible is inspired word by God. Does that word affect our emotions? When we read the word of God, do we feel what the word is saying to us? You know, like, you'd see... I love to just, I don't really post on Facebook. I just read people's comments. Right? And it's amazing how a person can just make a comment because whatever they read or whatever they saw was so bad or was so good that they had to pour their, their emotions out. I would, I, would, I would hope that that same emotion is expressed when we talk about the Word of God. I would hope. going to continue in Acts 19 and verses 11 to 17. It's a little story here. I guess we all know the story, right? Little girl, demon-possessed, and she was 
you know, saying about um, what Paul is doing. I'll read this part here. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had been touched, that he had touched, were taken to the sick, and their illness were cured, and the evil spirit left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirit tried to provoke the name of the Lord. What happened? He said, he just kind of rebuked the girl. Rebuked the girl, and the, the spirit left. Why? Because Paul, Paul knew what was happening there. He knew what was happening there. He knew that this little girl, right, was not speaking the truth from God, but that it was a plot from the men who were trying to make money. All right, I'm going to close with one last story. So this little boy, he, the parade was coming into the town, and his, he wanted to go see it so badly, his dad said, okay, if you do all your work, you get to go see the boy, uh, the, the parade. So that Saturday morning, the dad gave him the, the, the money. He went, and in the street was huge parade show of the circus going to the location. And he, sat, he, he stood there in the line, and he saw all the monkeys and the lions and whatever, and the clowns. And what he did, he gave his, one, he gave his money, his one dollar, to the clown and went home. He thought that that was the show, but he, was, he only saw the parade. He only saw the parade. He never went to see the show itself. Sometimes what we, what we do is that we only show up for the parade. We don't let, um, we don't let ourselves go in to, to really experience um, the show itself. This morning, I want to encourage us that I'm not saying that we're not reading the Word of God, but just to encourage us that it is the only way for us to be able to connect with God. Amen? Thank you.